You know those people who just can't tell a story right? Who just can't get the rhythm of a joke so the punchline actually lands? Maybe you are one of those people. No judgments here, no matter who you are or where you are on life's journey, you are welcome here. <laughs> we can't all be good at everything. Maybe those magical storyteller rhythms have always eluded you. They often elude me. Getting the beats of the story just right, getting the balance of the joke just so, explicitly laying out an argument, a theme, a plot, a satisfying conclusion, is an art. And it's an art that can be honed, but not all of us are natural fabulists. In high school, I had a friend who we fondly nicknamed the Fizzler. My group of friends was full of theater nerds, clowns, fools, outcasts in the high school social food chain, but confident and loquacious when left to ourselves. Many of them were budding raconteurs, desperate to model the style of basically any NBC sitcom star. Quips landed, stories swelled and ebbed exquisitely, and perfectly shaped jokes were followed by more perfectly shaped jokes. Perfectly told stories were met with more perfectly told stories. But not for the fizzler. She was beloved amongst us because she was an amazingly kind and faithful friend, but she just couldn't get the joke or storytelling thing down. And she would try, often. And every beginning would fill us with hope because she was sincere. And then she'd hit some beat that would just feel totally off, and then the story would just go on. Way past the moment when the group had lost interest, with the fizzler forgetting details and doubling back, with non sequitur tangents and bumbling sidebars that confused whatever point she had originally intended. And basically, after several minutes of sincere stumbling, the story would end in one of her famous fizzles swirling into nothingness. And instead of this sloppy ending being met with a chuckle, or maybe a groan, or at least a grunt of acknowledgement, it was always met with a moment of confused silence. We had been let down again. We had trusted the ride and been abandoned a long way from home. There was no tidy moral, no zippy climax, no reward for having listened. Each story fizzled like a dampened candle wick, sizzling in quiet disappointment. The fizzler re-earned her nickname every time. She was the sincerest fool among us. Her stories were always utter disappointments, frustrating teases, and she made fools of us every time. Every time we trusted her, she upended everything, giving us exactly what we didn't want and none of what we knew we wanted. It was like being continually punked on candid camera by a cruel prankster who doesn't even realize that she is the prankster. The fizzler dared to bore us at an age when we wanted so desperately to not be bored. I haven't seen The Fizzler in decades, but I've been thinking a lot about her over the past few months. And I don't know when you all realized that this year's Easter celebration was going to coincide with April Fool's Day, but I realized it early and I have been quivering in my balloon pants ever since. This is the first time since 1956 that this coincidence has occurred. Did you know that? I mean, okay, I'm gonna take a little sidebar here like the fizzler and tell you, 
that it's been since 1956 that it's happened, but guess what? We get it again in 10 years, and then, no, it's nine years, and then nine years after that. So get ready. They haven't kicked me out of this place. It's going to be a hullabaloo. But it's gotten me thinking about the foolish, the tricky, the shocking, the intentionally comical, or as in the Fizzler's case, the sincerely unintentionally comical. It's gotten me thinking about how essential the element of surprise is to our faith. No joke, progressive Christianity is at a threshold moment. I think every progressive faith community is at a threshold moment. In this country, at this specific juncture, those of us who approach our Christianity, who approach our faith through a less fundamentalist, more curious and creatively justice-minded lens, have continually felt our voices drowned out by those who wear their Christianity as party-line fundamentalism, as hateful Bible-beating, as plain old fear. Now, this isn't new. It's just newly refreshed in the wake of a political divide which threatens to falsely pit Christianity against basic human goodness. But we are in a moment when creative, justice-focused Christian organizing is on the cusp of reclaiming a voice in this country's political sphere. We have the teeth, we have the tradition, we have the talent, we have the compassion and curiosity. We just need to figure out a way to surprise ourselves. Just like our scripture tells us happened in that ancient tomb. In that tomb, the disciples turned a surprise reversal into the resurrection of a movement. And I fear we progressive Christians, we of progressive faith, have forgotten how to be surprised by our own faith, how to be resurrected by the power of our own stories. Just think how many Christians in this country alone will be reading or hearing some version of this Easter story today. Even if only half the Americans who claim to be Christian attend an Easter service, that's 140 million different heads and hearts trying to hear this story anew, trying to discern what the point of this whole Easter arc is. My mind melts thinking about how many different ways this resurrection story is being presented, from the politely progressive to the fiercely fundamentalist. In one church, it's probably being used as a quaint metaphor, vague and inoffensive. In another church, it's probably being used literally to guilt people into seeking a salvation they don't understand. Neither the impotent metaphor nor the punishing literalism sounds very fun or faithful to me. And to be completely clear, neither this sermon nor this service is designed to force you to have fun or to have faith. That's up to you. There are tons of recent reasons why we're not in a particularly festive, faithful mood these days. I thought of lots of foolish pranks to include in this service, and I scrapped them all in the interest of having some semblance of cohesive reverence. Cohesive reverence for what we're doing in this place. Cohesive reverence for all the people who have told this story before us. But having reverence is not the opposite of being playful. And having faith in our tradition is not the opposite of opening yourself up to being upended. In fact, I think having faith in our tradition requires us to continually open ourselves up to being surprised, to being awed, 
to being shocked by something we did not think was even possible. So in a time when the core Christian message tends to fizzle out under the noise coming from fundamentalism, I want to lift up together today the potential resurrective foolishness of the Christian tradition. I want to lift up the fact that the Easter story's power works precisely because no character in the story gets exactly what they think they want. I want to lift up the fact that the Easter story's continuing power works for us precisely because it continues to not give us the thing that we are convinced that we want. Easter gives us an empty tomb and a handful of conflicting stories and a suggestion that there may be more to reality than what we immediately see. But there is no satisfying conclusion. Any critic or undergrad professor would pick through all of the holes of this plot. But it's not a joke. It's not a prank. It's just an invitation to surprise. Easter is not the culmination of anything for Christians. It's the beginning of a lot of confused frustration. It's the start of a lot of work. So I don't know what pops out for you when you hear the words of today's two ancient testimonies, but first of all, let's hear it for the women. They are always the first to show up and always the first to figure everything out. But these scenes are classic farce. This is folly in the wake of grief. This scene might as well have slamming doors and a guffawing audience. The stories are not only confusing in and of themselves, but they get even more confusing when you view them side by side. And remember, there's also two other canonical gospels that aren't in our ancient testimony today, not to mention the Tons of other Gospels that didn't make their way into our canon. It's a mess. Some of the details line up, but barely. We've got a disappeared rabbi, an unsealed tomb, some guys in white chilling inside, different names of different women visiting the tomb first in different accounts, and... As if that's not foolish enough, in one account, Mary Magdalene doesn't even recognize Jesus, mistakes him for the gardener, and then kind of mouths off to him. It's the setup for a bad joke. This is more confusion than culmination. It might as well have been told by the fizzler. Now, I would say that this lack of cohesion used to bother me, but growing up, I never really noticed. I never noticed the inconsistent surprises in Scripture. I just swallowed the entire mess whole. The Easter story used to look like a big gold Fabergé egg to me, gleaming brightly as an unquestionable, invulnerable example of truth. It's only now as I reread this Easter story in a country and time that feels so fragmented, that the story feels so inconclusive. We don't get closure. We don't get a clean finish. We don't get answers. And contrary to what I was told in Sunday school, I no longer think Easter is about answers. I think Easter is the original April Fool's Day, not a prank, but an invitation to look at life the way a foolish clown would, a little topsy-turvy, a little skewed, with a whole lot of surprising potential. If you're looking for a conclusion, I know some of you might be, I think it's actually Good Friday that's the conclusion. It's the conclusion that the Roman Empire tried to impose on Jesus, that mysterious activist upstart who was simply making too much trouble. The Roman Empire wanted a satisfying climax. 
The Roman Empire wanted easy closure, a landed punchline, a dead body cold and accounted for. And empires continue to want such clean cutoffs. But the surprise of Easter is in those dangling plot threads. The empty tomb of unsatisfaction, the foolish surprise of being invited to believe that something inexplicable has just occurred, the laughable suggestion that the violence of earthly power does not always have the final word, the outlandish joke that mystery and awe are surrounding us all the time if we open ourselves up to it. Those ancient disciples opened themselves up to the surprise, to the foolishness, and they resurrected a movement. We can do the same. So I said I'd been thinking about the fizzler a lot. And it's funny what time and space and age reveals. Because when I now think back on my high school years, it's actually her stories, those famous fizzler stories that I remember all, all of over everything else. It's actually her diffuse, looping style that I recall over all my other high school chums' more surefire, quick-witted wordplay. The fizzler didn't give us the traditional setup and finish that would have left us fulfilled and fawning. She simply left us wondering what to do with all of those loose ends. And there's one story I remember over all of her other famous fizzles, and it's why I've been thinking of her so much over the past few months. She told it on a day when we were all sitting in the cafeteria, and as always, the quips were firing back and forth. And the fizzler had stayed pretty quiet the entire hour. But then she began to talk about her grandmother. And we all knew the fizzler's grandmother was in the hospital, that time was short, that grandma had been barely hanging on for several months. So we were all sort of half listening, you know, the way that upstart kids who don't think there's anything surprising coming their way kind of sort of half listen to something. And then the fizzler basically told a resurrection story. She said she'd been sitting alone next to her grandmother's hospital bed. Her mother had gone out to get laundry or something. And the room was filled with the beeping and whirring of medical machines. But her grandmother hadn't said anything for a long time. And the fizzler said at some point one machine made a flat line beeping sound and her grandmother's chest stopped rising and falling. And the fizzler started to cry because she knew that her grandmother was dead. And then Surprise, the machine started beeping again. And the fizzler's grandmother took in a new breath, and she opened her eyes, looked directly at the fizzler, gave a grandmotherly smile, and said, Oh, there you are, Annie. You're my second coming. And I remember that the fizzler repeated that to herself again. Oh, there you are, Annie. You're my second coming. Then the fizzler quietly laughed. And I remember that none of us laughed. I'm not proud of it. And the fizzler kept talking for a few more minutes, like always, losing us again. And I remember that the first thing I asked was, but is she dead now? <laughs> but my first questions should have been, what does she mean? 
What will you do? How can I help? But I was young and foolish then. We all were. The Fizzler's grandmother was dead. So we didn't know how to use our naive whip, wit to help her grieve. We didn't know how to take in a surprise that was unlike any surprise we'd ever thought to imagine. We didn't know how to open our hearts to a surprise that might upend everything we believed about endings and beginnings. But I'm grown up now, and I'm getting closer and closer to knowing that when faced with the resurrective surprise of the Easter story, the question is not, but is he dead now? The activating questions are, what does he mean? What will I do? How can I help? It doesn't matter if the story gets told right. What matters is what we do with those mysterious dangling threads together. Let's surprise ourselves. Amen. <laughs>